Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to ask you to please welcome Laura Thompson for our next talk. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Thompson. I work for Mozilla, and I have some confessions to make. Um, I look after a team called Cloud Services Engineering and Operations, and that's kind of a bunch of web devy stuff and services and ops and QA and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have a very long business title, and I had to abbreviate it to get in a business card. And my old job title said web architect slash evil genius. But now that I am a manager, I feel that I am supposed to be more formal. So what you need to know is that at heart, I am a web dev, regardless of what it says on my B cards. But I also have found later in life that I am, in spirit, an ops person, because I like things to work. I like graphs, and I swear a little bit too much. Um, I also like duct tape, and this is kind of a, a story that falls out of that. So, as a web dev, I'm also a continuous delivery enthusiast. I love continuous deployment. It's kind of, you know, when I get to a project, I find myself wanting to improve the deployment and delivery processes. <sighs> you know, why? Because continuous delivery is a modern best practice. We know that short cycle times are virtuous. It gives you a way to validate ideas and make sure that you're doing the right thing without sort of waiting a long time and, you know, spending two years building something to discover that nobody wants it. Um, it lets you incorporate user feedback quickly. And unintuitively, I guess, it reduces risk and actually increases the level of quality. As the delta of the thing you ship gets smaller, the risk goes down. So, having said that, Continuous delivery is for web apps, right? At Mozilla, we ship compiled software. We make Firefox. It's written in C++. So when I first proposed that we try to improve our delivery processes for Firefox, I got a lot of this. Continuous delivery is for web apps. And if, you have this, if you're saying this to me and you have this in mind, you probably have some kind of web app architecture that looks a lot like this. All right, it is pitifully simple. You know, if you're thinking of like a really complicated web app, perhaps it has sort of N web servers and M databases, and maybe some kind of caching layer or something. But, you know, I, I think that a lot of times people that write C++ tend to think of web devs as sort of slightly simple. Not actually the case. Okay, so, but Firefox is complicated. We can't continue to deliver Firefox. There is no architecture diagram for the whole of Firefox because it's too complicated to draw. This is the architecture of the password manager, which is a tiny, tiny little piece of Firefox. Um, so you can see, it, it's really complicated. This is our release engineering process. It doesn't matter that you can't read the words on the slide because that's not what I'm trying to get across to you. What I'm trying to get across to you is that it's really complicated. I admit that since we drew this diagram of our release engineering architecture, quick shout out, I used to run release engineering last year, well, year before now. Um, it's really complex. That's all you really need to know. There's all kinds of like build machines in there. We have, now we're down to three different version control systems from five. We have about 6,000, that was my doing. I was really happy to switch off CVS. Um, I know, right? <laughs> Should get a medal for that. Um, and also BZR, you know. Um, you don't need to clap for that one. <laughs> we have about 6,000 machines in the build farm because every time we make a build, we test it on all of the different operatings and SAS stuff, and that means that we run Windows XP in a data center because you can't run it in Amazon, and all kinds of really ugly things. It's complicated. There is no way you can do continuous delivery with this process. And I've kind of got news for you. Not all web apps are simple. Netflix. Most people here probably use Netflix. It's pretty complicated. This is an architecture diagram of their services. It's what they call a Death Star architecture diagram. Um, so this shows the 100 public services. They are code name. They are weighted by the amount of traffic that travels between them. They also have, this is, there's 100 of those. There's 1,100 private services that are not shown. They stream 35% of the internet's traffic at peak. Um, I have to thank the Netflix metrics team for making me this diagram, because I needed it for a slide, and they're very nice people. So they, can, they deploy a whole bunch of these things continuously, but in very small pieces, right? And they also deploy their clients continuously. So there's lots of other complicated things that use some form of continuous delivery. So then, let's come back to the question, how do we continuously deliver Firefox? Or, you know, to be more accurate about it, what we're really trying to do is reduce latency between Mozilla and the end user. How are we going to do that? So to begin, I think the easiest way to start thinking about this is to look at how we currently deliver Firefox. 
when I talk to people internally about this program, I don't need to tell them any of this stuff because they already know some of it or enough of it to make sense. So I need to give you all some context. Right now we use a, a train model for releases. We have a release train that goes out every six weeks. There are four release channels. There is Firefox Nightly, there is Aurora, which is now known as Developer Edition, there is Beta, and then there is a release channel. And every six weeks we promote builds um, from one channel to the next, it's called Uplift. So this is called the rapid release model. Um, I remember when we adopted it, because that was starting around Firefox 4. Before that, it wasn't what you would call rapid. If you look back at the timeline, you'll see there's some number of years between Firefox 3 and Firefox 4, and those were not really good years. OK, so how do we do it? We have four repos, one for each of those channels, Mozilla Central, which is nightly, Mozilla Aurora, Mozilla Beta, Mozilla Release. And yes, they are repositories and not branches. And you know, sue me, I didn't come up with that idea. They should be branches. Um, we use Mercurial, and we were one of the first big users of Mercurial. So I think if, if we were doing it now, we wouldn't have done it like this. Changing it's really hard, though. OK, so having talked about that, there are, I think, a lot about deployment and delivery, and these are kind of some models for you to think about. In terms of the velocity at which you ship, there are sort of four basic models. And the first one, critical mass model, is what we used to use up till Firefox 4. That is, do we have enough stuff for it to be worth shipping a release? And the problem with that is you're always like, yeah, it just doesn't seem like enough. Let's put it off a little longer. And the bigger a release gets, the more complicated it is, the harder it is to test. The more people are like, oh, can we just wait another month until this thing is done? Because we really don't want to ship this release without this. And critical mass shipping is a disaster, and I encourage none of you to do it. Um, hard deadlines, which are very common in, say, the games industry because of marketing. This game is coming out on March 15th come hell or high water, right? And you've got no, nothing to do but make it work by that day, better or worse. What we use is called a train model, which says every, you know, at timed intervals a train departs and whatever code is ready to get on the train gets on the train and is shipped. There's kind of a, a lot of discipline people have to get about that, because when they've come from a critical mass model, they have this idea that like, they have to get stuff into the release every six weeks, and it's just like, just chill, it will be on the next train. It is very hard for marketers to get their head around that model, incidentally, and even more hard for them to get their head around continuous deployment, which is when something's done, then you ship it on a very small scale rather than the whole product. OK. Um, another way to think about it is, I have this concept of a deployment or delivery maturity model, and probably if you have a computer science degree, you probably sat through some very boring class in the first year where somebody talked about the capability maturity model. And if you work in government, somebody may still talk about it at work, and I'm sorry. But <clears throat> there's sort of this idea that there are kind of five phases to any process that you have. And when you first do it, it's kind of chaotic, and it involves a lot of individual heroics. It's one person staying up all night to make the builds work, and there are no scripts, and nothing is automated. Step two is you have some documentation. Step three is you do it the same way every time and you've made some improvements, um, probably mostly automated. By the time you get to step four, you actually have metrics, you have graphs, right? If you have graphs, you are hopefully in stage four. Um, and then when you get to five, you're sort of at this point of continual improvement and innovation. And I think, feel like where we are at Mozilla is on the verge of five, right? We have. Some of them are pretty crafty processes, but we've kind of come through stages one till four. So let me tell you how we do the other parts, how we ship other things to our end users. I've talked about our release model is very complicated. I've talked about the trains. Let's talk about updates. So let's say that you have Firefox 43, and you're going to update to Firefox 44. How does that work? Um, you create the new build. And you generate what is called a partial mar, that is the file format that Firefox ships in, hence partial mars. Um, uh, a partial mar, the way you generate it is you take the old build and you take the new build and you do a binary diff between them, essentially uses MD MBS diff, and you take that partial mar that you have generated and you serve it through our update server, which is called Balrog. Yes, our update server is called Balrog. Um, once a day, Firefox calls home and says to Balrog, hey, do you have anything for me? And Balrog says, here's a URL, go get that thing. This is kind of important to note for later, because that was a decision that was made that made much of this stuff that I'm going to talk about much easier. OK. The second kind of update we have is a thing called a hotfix. Um, a hotfix is kind of a, we need to make a change, and it's typically just a config change. It can be things like enabling something or more frequently disabling something. We shipped something and it didn't go well and now we would like to turn it off. 
So what's interesting about hotfixes? Hotfixes are not compiled code. Hotfixes are add-ons. So they're a browser extension. Um, I'll talk about these more in a little bit. So a hotfix is installed. It runs once to change the config settings, and then it uninstalls itself, um, which is kind of problematic for audit trail. Like you don't necessarily know what ran and in what order. So if you're trying to fix a problem, it's very challenging. The other thing with hotfixes is because they're just a config change, they don't go through full test automation. And I have some horror stories I could tell you involving like, oh, I'm just going to make a hotfix. It's 10 lines of code, and I will cut and paste from this sample code that contains the URL of the FTP server and not the CDN. And 300 million people hit the FTP server. I do not recommend. Um, it's S3 now, so now it would stay up, but just be really expensive. So, OK. OK. Um, there's also these things called add-ons. Put up your hand if you've never heard of Firefox add-ons. They're pretty. You have never heard of them? Or you haven't? You have, well, it doesn't matter. OK, they're extensions. If you've used Chrome or Opera and haven't used Firefox, it's the same thing. Um, so add-ons are interesting. They are not compiled. They ship as what's called a zippy file, which is a zip file under the hood, good old-fashioned zip. You can download them from addons.mozilla.org. They are now signed, and that is controversial, and I'm not going to talk about that. Um, End users choose to install them, and people have their favorites, right? Like everybody likes uBlock or tree, tree style tabs or whatever it is. They like to be able to mess with the browser. Interesting thing, your add-ons update automatically. When an add-on developer puts a new release of their add-on on AMO, addons.mozilla.org, the user will ping for updates and get the newest one automatically. <sighs> What's interesting about a couple of other things about add-ons. Um, they're turning into web extensions, which is kind of interesting because they become compatible with Chrome extensions and Opera extensions at that point. I just feel like I should mention that. But the other thing that's kind of interesting about add-ons is an add-on is a modular piece of code that does one thing. It runs against a particular build of Firefox. It is updated independently of the platform. So this is really interesting. So that release process, it's really, really long. To ship a build from, we have an app called Ship It, Give it a change set. 12 hours later, you have a certified build. 12 hours is a really long time, by the way. It's really, really robust, and we do buckets and buckets of testing, right? Um, tests are painful. We talk about what tests could we not run to make this shorter. Should we stop running the tests that always pass? Should we reduce the tests that are intermittently failing, intermittently orange? Um, but some of those show you where there are race conditions in code, so we don't want to do that. Um, but there's a lot of gatekeeping. and tests and metrics and graphs and so on. I will tell you that gatekeeping is sort of at the antithesis of continuous delivery, right? You want to build your process to, processes to be relatively sort of self-healing and easy to fix. And if you ship broken code, it's so easy to fix, ship it, that then you just unship it, right? That's sort of the opposite of what we do here. So this was the genesis of the Go Faster program. And Go Faster is what I called it when I first sent an email saying, I think we should do this thing. And Dave Camp, who runs the Firefox side of Firefox and Cloud Services, said, you should call it lower latency, because it's not actually about going faster. It's about reducing the latency to which, with which we ship stuff to the user. But lower latency is kind of not very catchy. Can't really put it on a t-shirt. So this is the name that we are stuck with, even though PR does not like it. So here we are. We came up with five ways to get parts of Firefox to the end user with reduced latency. And here's what they are. I'm going to talk about each one of them at a time. Uh, we have this idea of system add-ons. We have a program called Test Pilot, and it is not the old program that we used to call Test Pilot. I'll talk about that more in a minute. We are shipping data updates separately from code, because logical. We have introduced the concept of downloadable concept, and if you play games, you're familiar with that concept already. And we are building more features as web apps. All right, the first one of those is system add-ons. And again, you know, you should just not let engineers name stuff. I named these, and it's really confusing. Um, this is a picture of an add-ons t-shirt, actually, from Firefox 3, with the photo was taken by um, Flood, who is one of our localizers. <sighs> OK, system add-ons. So a system add-on is not an add-on that you choose to install. It is a part of core Firefox. It is part of the core code base that we carved off into an add-on. It's a way to modularize our very difficult to draw or modularize code base. And we've re-implemented it as an add-on. So what we're really doing here is taking this mechanism that we made for the community to modify their own Firefox and going, well, why don't we just use that? Because it's so much easier to do that than to go through this 12-hour build process for like a one-line change. OK, so what's nice about it? When you are working on a system add-on, 
you don't have to build Firefox. Um, you don't have to build anything. You just take your existing Firefox and install your add-on, and you're gone. Um, you can update via Zippy uh, and just update one thing at a time, which reduces the risk, reduces the surface area for things that could go wrong. Um, for right now, you can update them up to daily on any release channel. And we are using our central updater for these, which is why the once daily limit. Uh, we have a plan for that. And uh, system add-ons are signed with Mozilla's keys and are slightly more trusted. They have different properties internally than a regular sort of third-party add-on. Um, they have a different add-on type, which means they have slightly escalated privileges. They don't show up in the add-ons manager. Um, we, th we may get to a point where we want to let people uninstall them, but right now it seemed like a way to, sort of given that they are actually core features, a way for people to break their browser in ways that would be really hard to fix. So MVP, version one, not uninstallable. We'll probably get to that, but not yet. Okay, so here's the really cool thing about add-ons. Add-ons, many add-ons now are what's called restartless, which means when you update an add-on, you don't need to restart the browser for it to get the new version. So think about that. You are shipping compiled software and you ship somebody a new version and they don't have to restart to get it. And this is actually where I get really excited because this is cool. Restarts suck, right? It's a horrible user experience. Um, that thing, you know, if you use Spotify, which I love, right? Um, a new version of this client is available. Would you like to update? No. No. We are very well trained to say no. Um, <clears throat> and if you don't offer an update, the, if you don't offer a restart to the user, then you have to wait until they restart, and that's also can be few and far between. Who runs OS X? When did you last restart your laptop? When did you last restart your browser? Probably when it crashed, right? And that might not have been for a long time. Like, I, I use Firefox and OS X. It's, like, weirdly stable, I am told. Like, it might be nine months since I restarted it. So, <laughs> except that I'm consciously trying to get updates. So how do we do it? We talked about, like, can we force a restart? That's really unfriendly because a lot of JavaScript apps, we can't resume, right? It's really hard to pick up where you left off, and we don't want to do that to the end user. <sighs> but if we can do it restartless, that's really awesome. This code has literally just landed. We haven't shipped it yet for restartless system add-ons. Um, we need to figure out how to not destroy the user's experience. Um, the first system add-on is Firefox Hello, which is a thing, if you haven't used it, because nobody uses it, by the way, please do. It's kind of cool. Um, uses WebRTC, it's all open standards, blah, blah, blah. And we didn't want to update your hello when you were in the middle of making a call, because that just seems like edge cases and unpleasant things live there, so we didn't do that. Okay, um, so the new version will allow you to detect whether you are, you know, it, it's a blocking update, right? It doesn't update until the add-on says, okay, you can update now. All right, so what are these kinds of things good for? System add-ons, particularly good for things where you want to rapidly iterate, particularly on the front end. So we have Firefox Low. It's actually really cool. I use it all the time. Very few of our end users use it, and we want to try some different things, particularly with the UI, to see if we can make it stickier. If you are a web developer, this sounds really familiar, right? It's growth hacking. You do it all the time. Um, and the concept of not being able to do it, it's like having all my fingers chopped off and I can't do anything, so now we can. Um, they're really good for wrappers for services, and coming from a cloud services background, more and more often there are features that wrap a cloud service. And that cloud service might get deployed daily, and it would be really nice if the thing that talks to it could also be deployed daily. So if you need to make a, you know, a parameter change or something, you don't have to be sort of endlessly worrying about backwards compatibility. The third thing we're doing with them is replacing hotfixes, which don't have an audit trail, and these do, and they go through our test automation as much as you want, um, so it's a bit safer. Some parts of system add-ons are hard. Okay, um, localization is hard. Uh, the way localization works in Firefox is very difficult to explain. Um, any localizers here? Anyone that does Mozilla localization? I have the greatest admiration of people because it is not trivial. Um, some of the strings we have are in Gecko at compile time, and if they're not there, then it won't compile or it won't start. Um, so we need to make that go away. We are moving towards a world where you can update one string at a time. We live in this world of kind of string freezes and so on. But I want those code to go away. I want to be able to ship a release and then we have a string that catches up and we just ship one string. Uh, you know, a whole update is one string and it's trivial because I feel like that's how it sorts to work. The other thing that's nice about that is sort of having worked in open source for so many years now, I know that if you as a contributor contribute something, 
the faster it gets reviewed and landed, the more likely you are to contribute again. Because there's something really, really awesome about knowing that the code that you wrote or the localization that you contributed or the documentation that you wrote is in the hands of an end user, right? Like you, you contributed something and it's being used. Like that, that's one of the reasons that we do this, right? You want to help people and it's rewarding. If you submit a patch and it sits there for four years, you will never submit a patch again. So. That's really awesome. Second thing is there's a UX optimization here that we have to make, and we are still playing with this. We want to give people a better browser faster, so if people say, hey, this sucks, we can change it really quickly. Um, but there is also this idea of update fatigue. Think about how much people complain when we change anything UI. Um, you know, I, far be it for me to talk about the shapes of tabs or anything like that. Um, but there's a lot of really angry people. It's amazing how people do it. Angry people can get about the shape of a tab. Sacrilege. Um, but uh, yeah, so we want to make sort of strike a balance there between um, fix things quickly and annoy the users. It's always a balance. I think one of the things there is that there is a small population of users who are very vocally complainy. Um, and I think sometimes we pay too much attention to them and they're not the 99% as it were. Okay, third thing. Um, right now when we ship new features, we don't have guidelines about the minimum amount of telemetry that you need to ship a feature. And for this, this is changing. If you want to ship a system add-on, then you have to meet a certain amount of telemetry requirements. Because there's no point in iterating quickly if you're not measuring what you're doing. If you ship something and you don't know if it works right, why would you bother? So. The two tricky things, we spent a lot of time talking about dependency management on Firefox and dependency in between system add-ons. And we decided that we did not want to rebuild a package manager, right? Like I didn't want to build FPM or whatever Firefox package manager with this horrible like dependency juggling and oh, anyone has ever worked on a dependency manager. And this is a Linux conference, so I know there are people that have. I just didn't want to do that. So <clears throat> every six weeks when we ship a release train, we will ship with it the current version of all the system add-ons, right? And system add-ons only target a single version of Firefox at a time. And for version one, we don't uh, support any dependencies between system add-ons. We may get there. I wouldn't go more than one level, but I'd like to be able to do things like if we put dev tools in a system add-on, I would like to be able to have system add-ons on top of dev tools specifically. Okay. So what are we actually using this for? So we have things shipping. If you are running Firefox beta, you will find that the Firefox Hello that you have is already shipping as a system add-on. And it's in beta right now. It will go to release in version 46, which is in about five weeks. We are going to do our first update any day now. Might be this week. Um, it's kind of exciting. We've done a lot of test stuff and you know tests on Nightly and Aurora, but this is sort of the first system add-on update, like a between off-schedule update, asynchronous update, um, to a really large number of users. So that's exciting. If you want to learn more about this, you can go to the Go Faster wiki page, and I'll put these slides up so you can look at that. All right, that's kind of the, the first program, and that is the one that has sort of required the most uh, human juggling, right, because it touches a lot of work done by different teams. Second thing is a program we are calling Test Pilot. And Mozilla previously had a program called Test Pilot. This is a different Test Pilot. We have kind of... You know, I think we have lovely branding people, but we really like to reuse names, <laughs> persona. Um, so we're calling it Test Pilot. This is actually a picture of uh, Colonel Jacqueline Cochran, who was a famous American racing and test pilot, which is cool. Anyway, um, so what is Test Pilot? This is a program where if you are on the release channel, so the mainstream version of Firefox, you can opt in to using new features. Right. And we are specifically targeting release channel users. One thing we've discovered over the years, and one of the things that I have worked on at Mozilla, is the crash reporting system. And you learn a lot of things about users. And one of the things that you learn is that people on pre-release channels are very, very different from people who are on release channel. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, they have different operating systems. They have different plugins, Flash, stuff like that, Java, hardware. Um, there is a small but non-zero and significant percentage of release channel users that run Windows XP, right? Um, or geriatric versions of OS X. And I'm, actually, Linux users are mostly good, right? As you probably expect, they tend to update their stuff. Um, but XP is a very sad story. And if you want, if you catch me in the bar later, you can ask me about SHA-1. But I will need to have had five beers before I will talk about it. Um, OK. So, test pilot. Features are going to be developed as add-ons, regular add-ons, not system add-ons. They are optional. They're not part of Firefox yet. 
The thing that's kind of nice about that, if we offer you, you know, think of it as like, you probably used like um, Google Labs or any one of those things where you can add a feature to Gmail or whatever. Um, think of it like that. If people like it, if it is successful, we can convert it to a system add-on by flipping a bit. That's really nice. There's a nice graduation process. If we find that it's something where um, there's a small but very enthusiastic population of people that like it, like tab groups or something, um, then we can keep it as a regular add-on and graduate it to AMO. So we have nice options there. If you want to read more about this, again, a wiki page. <laughs> the third thing, third program that we have is this idea that data should be separate from code because they are like night and day. Again, think back to first year computer science. So data isn't code. And you'd be surprised at the amount of data files that we ship with Firefox. Um, security policies, what certs are trustworthy. Uh, we have various block lists. We have you know, um, a flash block list. We have a graphics card block list. We have an add-ons and plug-in block list. The most common use of this is blocking like versions of Flash and Java. Um, but occasionally other things uh, like dubious toolbars that crash your browser or steal your information and stuff like that. So once a day, Firefox pings and we send you a block list. We send you an initial version. There's the tracking protection list, which we use um, as part of private browsing. These are the things, there's two sets, blacklist and a whitelist, things we won't show you, things we will show you. We have a whole bunch of dictionaries, many, many fonts, hyphenation tables, all kinds of wacky stuff. All right. So in order to update any of those things, we need to take 12 hours and ship a release, and that's really messed up. Um, particularly the example that I think of is that certificate revocation, we have to ship a dot release, and we actually, there's actually a, a way to not do that, and we haven't been using it, and that makes me sad. So we're going to fix this. The other problem we have that's related to this is because we have all of these different data files, where we have updated them independently of a Firefox release, every single one has a different updater. Also, not good. It means when you are trying to track down a problem, there are so many places you could look in, and you might not know some of them exist. So one of the secondary goals of this, by the way, is to converge all of our updates into a single update channel. I think it makes, every, it makes us happier. It makes the user happier. Because they're like, why are all these different things calling out to different places? Won't happen anymore. So how are we solving the data update issue? We have a project called Kinto. Kinto is really cool. And we are accepting submissions for a better logo. Um, it is a Dragon Ball style magical cloud. Right? I am told that it looks like a cow's stomach. So if you happen to be artistically talented, speak to me later. But what is Kinto? Kinto is actually really magical. Um, it's kind of a lightweight JSON thing. You speaks native JSON over HTTP, it will sync stuff for a user, you can share stuff between users, you can sign data that's coming out of it so that you know that it came from Mozilla. There's a bunch of offline stuff that we're not using for anything yet. So really it is um, a thing that sort of has all of the niceties of couch, but the back end of it is Postgres. If you think of it sort of like a couch proxy layer in front of Postgres, you wouldn't be too far off, and everybody loves Postgres because it's you know, very respectful of your data, um, which is important for some of these things. OK, so how does it work? If you are doing one of these data updates, when you send your update ping to Balrog, Balrog says, oh, I have a data update for you. And the URL that it gives you is not a URL to a partial mar file or to a zippy file for a system add-on. It gives you a URL to Kinto. And Kinto says, here's some data for you and a signature. Um, you download it, you verify, you're installed, and you're done. I'm actually really excited. This is a super cool project. And Kinto is very active as an open source project. You're welcome to, like, independent. You don't need to use anything else. Feel free to go play with it. Um, very active, very good team working on that. So what kind of stuff is this good for? The first two projects that we have is we're using it for our one CRL client for certificate revocation. Um, and that's coming out shortly. Somebody is beeping. Um, and the second thing is the add-ons block list. Right now, to revoke a cert, we need to ship a Firefox release. To block a new add-on, we need to ship an AMO release. And that's kind of messed up, right? Um, so add-ons block lists will move into Kinto. Fourth thing, downloadable content. Uh, this is our Linux download button, which is why it has a penguin on it. If you play games, you are familiar with the concept of downloadable content, or DLC. There are the background behind this is there are some parts of the browser that may not be used very frequently um, or may not be needed when on startup, so we can download them later. So an example I think of, there's lots of examples actually in Fennec, which is Firefox for Android, which the APK contains all of the different languages. 
it's kind of messed up. You don't need all those languages in there. You should just be asked which one you want, and then we'll download it on demand. Um, so you can install some of these things on demand the first time you use it. Again, this is not in the plan, but you know, somewhere I would like to get to is if you're on a release channel, Firefox doesn't ship with DevTools by default. This is not approved by any product manager, so don't quote me. Um, but the first time you open it, it downloads and installs. Because smaller downloads and smaller updates are more likely to be installed, right? The conversion rate is much, much higher. So it's, it's good if you can keep the original size down. Okay, and for this DLC stuff, we're using Balrog and Kinto. Again, Balrog's the updater, Kinto's cloud storage to deliver files. So what are we using it for? Um, for content that we only use in specific use cases. Um, the very first example is Android, and we're going to put all of the other fonts, like not the default font, this way. Um, particularly APK size on Android is a really big deal. If it is big, people won't complete their downloads, right? It's that simple. So if we can take out all of those fonts that mostly people never use, we can get a huge percentage decrease in size. And this might ship today. <laughs> I asked this morning, and they're like, it might be today. It probably be this week. We'll see. Um, wrestling with a CDN issue. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to talk about, the fifth mechanism, is remote features. And this is browser features that look like part of your browser that are themselves web apps. And this is really the way of the future, right? At some point, a browser should be a very thin layer of Chrome, and most of it should be webby and cached. So think of your browser as probably in the future a collection of offline web apps. Um, so I can't talk much about this one because it's super, super early. We have done a bunch of these in the past, but this is a new approach. So things that we have right now that work this way, if you have a Firefox account, the login page is served remotely. It's probably not stunning to you. Um, another one is if you go to about colon health report, I actually wrote that. It does this wacky stuff where we wanted to be able to change the graphs and things that it draws. So it pulls HTML and JavaScript and CSS from a CDN and uses post message to inject data from the client, so your data stays with you and renders pretty graphs of it. So, <sighs> okay, um, but yeah, so there will be more and there's some really, really cool stuff coming down this pipeline. Again, really, really good for things where we want to iterate quickly. The other thing is it's actually much easier to find and hire web devs than it is to find and hire Firefox desktop engineers. So that helps too. Where are we going? Um, sort of the futures. Um, number one goal for Q1 was to make it easy for other projects to implement. And I already know that there are like two teams at Mozilla that have taken this and done it and gone, look, we made our project into a system add-on. And I was really happy because that, I think, means that we made it easy enough because we haven't even written any docs yet, except the sort of meeting notes and so on. The other big thing for the first half of the year is better knobs and dials. We want to be better at shipping canaries. We want to be able to ship A-B tests. We want a better data visualization for product managers because right now they have to go in and write code to figure out if it was a good idea or not. The thing on here that I'm probably most excited about is push-based updates. So instead of pinging polling once a day, do you have an update for me? For urgent updates, we can say, you need to go and download this now. Again, certificate revocation. I think that's really powerful. I don't want somebody to wait a whole day to get a certificate revoked um, if we can do it everybody in quarter of an hour, that'd be fantastic. And finally, sort of making the L10M processes simpler. Okay, uh, that is about all I have to say. I will take some questions. I am told from long back that you should always put something cute on your last slide, because then all the sort of the hard questions just slid right out of your brains, because you're going, oh, puppy, if you like dogs. Anyway, this, this is my accidental puppy. She walked out of the woods, so I'll take questions. Any questions? There's one down here at the front. What's a canary? Oh, what's a canary? <laughs> it's like a canary in a coal mine. Um, so the expression of a canary is you ship something to 1% or some really tiny percentage of your users and wait and see if they all die. <laughs> and if they don't die, then you ship it to more. Well, you know, crash or have a bad experience or uninstall the browser or whatever. So, yeah. Good question. Any other questions? One in the middle there. <laughs> yeah, version numbering is a pain. Um, you know, I'm, you're, not, you're talking to the wrong person. I lobbied for Semver. Um, but um, so the way that it will work is that each system add-on has its own version numbering. So the version of hello that ships with Firefox 45 is hello 45. And when we update it, it's hello 45.1. So that's Firefox 45 with hello 45.1.
you know, it's a nice thing about sort of modularizing them, um, and that's where we get into all of the package man management discussions, of course. But every and every module has its own version number. So, yep. Other questions? Yes. It's a great question. Do we support rollbacks, and if so, how do you test them? Um, yeah, and that's very one of the very explicit goals here is to support rollbacks. Um, so. A rollback for some of these things is as simple as back the code out, rebuild, right, effectively. We might be able to make it easier than that. One thing that we also have is like the, the last ditch rollback is rollback to the version that shipped with the browser, so rollback to 45.0, because we know that works, that had like the full suite of test automation. Um, and we should also be able to disable it pretty easily as well. That's, that's the kind of stuff we're working on right now. This is all very in flight, which is why it's kind of exciting. So. That's fair. What is the worst possible thing that could happen? Um, so the, the worst thing that can happen with a Firefox release in general is that it has a startup crash in it, right? Um, a startup crash means that you open the browser and it crashes, and then you open the browser and it crashes, and you have no point of recourse, right? So you, what you have to do to recover to that would be go to Mozilla's website and install a new version of Firefox, and you're not going to do that. You're just going to open Chrome, right? So that's the worst case scenario. Most of those are, most startup crashes are caused by things in the back end of Firefox. Mo and the, so in the C++ layer. Firefox has Gecko, which is rendering engine, which is C++. All of the graphic stuff lives in there, and most startup crashes begin there. Um, on the other side of things, the front end, it's actually very, very hard to cause a browser crash. You can have degraded experience, but it's JavaScript at the end of the day. Um, you can have crashes. The tricky part is actually the interactions. So I work on the tracking protection back end, and we did actually ship a bad list once, um, and that caused a startup crash because Firefox starts, and it pings for list updates, and loaded the new list, and was like, but we noticed really quickly and shut it off. Um, so the trick there, I think, is to have sufficiently good telemetry that you know. Um, we also have a program, which a lot of my teams is working on, which is called Shield, which is the idea of self-repair, um, which can look at your configuration and so on and look at your crashes and say, this is not working, you have, have all these startup crashes, let me just flip some config dials because I think I know how to fix this. Um, I think it helps. You know, nothing is without risk. I think one of the biggest goals here is to ship small enough releases that it's very easily to isolate a problem. Um, that's, you know, from my webby background, it makes things so much easier. And you actually just have, I feel like you have so many less problems, um, which is nice. So. Oh, sorry, I think I skipped. I'll go to this person first. I, um, with the increasing dynamic connection to things actually in the web, Yep. How do you, uh, do you have any comments on how this will inter um, impact things like Ice Weasel? How it will impact things like? Ice Weasel. Oh, Ice Weasel. That's a good question. Um, I haven't honestly thought about it, to be honest, because it's not, my goal is to make Firefox better. It's not to, you know, if Ice Weasel wants to come along, that's fantastic. But, you know, it's not a consideration for me. Wait for the mic because I can't even hear you. Sorry, yeah. I'm happy to repeat the question, but I can't hear. So, yep. Uh, you said hot fixes had no audit trail. Mm -hmm. Did you have experiences of hot fixes causing a problem that you then took a lot longer than you thought to track down the problem, like a severe problem? I think they're mostly so. Hot fix problems mostly tend to come up when you're kind of individually debugging with someone because you can't look at the browser and see if a hotfix ran easily or not. Like that's not something you can detect. It's gone. It uninstalled itself. And that, that's just like a, I think that's an anti-pattern actually. Um, so we're not going to do that anymore. Yeah. Not bulk problems, but I know support comes across it a lot. So, yeah. Um, oh, more at the back. Sorry. So with the update signing, how do you actually bootstrap that trust chain? Um, with the with the signing keys for the um, updates, with the signing keys for the updates. So remember, where they're still shipping a train every six weeks, right? Um, so that's actually relatively straightforward. I know there's, there's a question here. If someone wants to bring him a mic, there's a question there. Okay. That is a great question. Um, the question was, do you know how this will affect the ESR channel? And current policy for the ESR channel is we will not ship system add-on updates um, to them. 
right? So they'll just stay with whatever they got. You know, if they were actually, I don't even know what the last ESR release was, but if it, if it was release N, then they'll have version N of all of the system add-ons, and we won't update it. So, unless we would do a chem spill, which we would do for them anyway. Chem spill, by the way, is emergency dot release, like security type problem usually, or startup problem. Um, we call it a chem spill because a lot of people call them fire drills. It's chem spill because it's not a drill. It's actually like toxic waste going on. Uh, there's a question down here, sorry. Can you yell? So the, uh, mm -hmm. Add-ons that we are least fond of. So, I'm not going to name any names because I don't know what the current bad offenders are. Um, and also, I don't work on it anymore. It was the add-ons was the very first thing I worked on when I started at Mozilla. I wrote the first version of the add-on manager API. So, um, the kinds of we call them bad ons, which is terrible, um, but it gets the point across. So, kinds of add-ons that I don't like. Ones that report uses data to dubious third parties and do dubious things with it. There's a whole bunch of those. And we try to pick it up and not have them on there, right? And actually, the recent addition of signing was to try and stop this sort of stuff from happening. Um, that's probably the worst case. And then add-ons that cause crashes. There was a, I'm sorry, I'm going to call out Skype. The Skype toolbar was our number two crasher um, for a while. And we blocklisted it, and they fixed it really, really fast. I appreciate how fast they fixed it. Um, like, within hours, it was a very good job. So, um, but yeah, they're generally not a, they're not a bad actor, but we just had to do something about it quickly. So yeah, those are really pretty much the worst cases. Some of them will do things that hijack your browser. So um, things like changing your search engine without your permission and not letting you change it back. Right, that's the kind of thing. Or changing any of your config settings without your permission and not letting you change it back um, is pretty evil, I think. So. Yes, I think that's fair to say. Um, there's, there's a good amount of collaboration. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is there much collaboration between open source browsers? And I think, yes, most of it is informal. Um, like, you know, everybody knows everybody else, especially if they're involved in standards. Um, so that's probably the, the principle. And there's not an area I'm involved in at all. Robert O'Callaghan is here somewhere, and he can talk to you about that all day. So. <laughs> so. Back. It's about mitigating the release cycle. Yes. Uh, yep. So are you actually, do you have any plans to actually improve your release cycle to bring down that 12-hour, yep. 24-hour build? Yes, and that's a running, um, a parallel project. But that's actually pretty hard. So most of what, the, the one big thing we want to do is change the way we do localization repacks, because that will carve a couple of hours off it. Um, the big thing that takes most of the time is running tests, right? And we have spent a lot of hours trying to make our tests run faster and to run them in parallel and not run all the tests all the time. And that, you know, sort of test gardening is a continuous process. Um, and, you know, I think you have to be really grateful to people that do that work because it's pretty tedious and incredibly helpful. So, yeah. But it's not, it's not a simple thing to solve, unfortunately. So, uh, I think Perhaps there was one, one more. more. One more, yep. People ran out of questions at exactly the right time. Thank you for coming to my talk. I'm always happy to talk about this more, so find me afterwards. Thank you.